thank you very much. There's also there had been uh, also a change in the title, but <laughs> anyway, the title was so 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 vague that uh, I could have talked about pretty much everything, but I. Uh, decided to spend my 18 minutes to tell you that there is actually hope to go into the uh, nonlinear regime. It's not as ugly as it may seem. So um, perturbation theory breaks up, but it's not that scary. So what happens when, whenever you, your density contrast uh, becomes of order, of, of order one, then there is no hope to uh, use a perturbation theory because it doesn't matter how careful you are, eventually it will break, it will break, up, break down. So you must do something else. And uh, the th I think that the, the natural thing to do is to uh, give up Fourier space because well, there are many ways uh, to, to, to look at the statement, but one uh, a possible one is to say that the uh, pileup of uh, uh, high density regions that are localized in space breaks uh, the translational symmetry, and so Fourier space is not as appealing as, as it is when you have uh, uh, translational invariance. On the other, on the other hand, this, uh, uh, these high density regions are localized in real space, and so when seen from outside, they have approximate spherical symmetry, so we better try to use this uh, approach in, in real space. So what one has in mind typically is that you have your universe that contains uh, clouds of particles. These clouds uh, move around. They have center of mass motion. They spin around their center of mass, and then they also collapse on the center of mass under the effect of uh, self-gravity. So you have shells, oh, you have shells that will fall onto the center of mass and they'll, uh, they will uh, um, eventually crush the, 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 the region that is enclosed in the shell. So the, the, the density, the enclosed density will become very large when the shell will become very small, becomes very small. So, uh, one may hope to follow this process by simply looking at the, uh, the multiple expansion of the potential generated by the internal matter distribution of each shell. Um, and the first term of the multiple expansion is, is, is the monopole, which gives you simply spherical collapse. So this multiple expansion is intrinsically nonlinear, so it has a nice picture. It, it, it becomes, so this term becomes larger and larger when R becomes small. When, but, uh, and, and it's known to mm, converge uh, very uh, fast outside of the region that you are looking at. So um, on the other hand, uh, the center of mass, mass motion and, and the torques are induced by the potential given by the matter distribution outside your region. And this is uh, something that uh, can be expanding in, it looks more like a Taylor series, so it is something that you may hope to treat with perturbative methods. So um, then, okay, you have quadrupoles and, and shear, so the, you, you will have uh, corrections to spherical collapse, but uh, uh, anyway, let's just, uh, I will not go into this for, for, for now. So one thing that I want to point out is that the spherical evolution is only sensitive to the total mass that is enclosed in the shell that is collapsing. So it does not feel the inner uh, density profile. So it, it's only the mean density that matters. So this, the, the, the nature of gravity, together with the symmetry of the problem that you're looking at, uh, has built in a smoothing uh, procedure and a smoothing scale uh, that is uh, given by the radius of the shell that you're considering. So there is a smoothing scale and there's a filter and this filter has to be a top hat in real space because this is what your problem is dictating to you. So if I follow a spherical collapse, then uh, I have only one uh, quantity, the, the mean density, and conventionally it is parameterized by uh, the mean, de mean initial density, uh, which is linearly evolved, and that means it's mu just multiplied by the growth factor of linear perturbations. And uh, uh, I define, if you want, my, my, my high density regions as uh, those regions whose uh, 
uh, mean initial density, uh, those, those shell whose mean initial density uh, multiplied by, ev evolved linearly at the redshift of, of interest uh, becomes larger than, than a threshold, which is the threshold for circular collapse. So, um, I can skip this, I think. So, uh, this is a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, the, what uh, excursion set theory is, or projector theory is. So, at each location, I consider uh, a set of shells around the position X, and uh, as uh, R, the radius of the shell changes, the density enclosed in each, in each shell changes because, and, and it's, it describes uh, a random walk because I'm starting with a random field. So, and I'm looking at the largest of these uh, shells that, uh, for which the mean, de the mean and close density is above threshold. So it's actually a first passage problem. But it's a first passage problem of a peculiar kind because the steps of these, uh, of the, these uh, random walks are, are correlated. Technically, one says that the process, the stochastic process is non-Markovian, which means that the conditional probability of one of delta at one scale given delta at a larger scale also depends on all the other scales of the problem. So it's a complicated uh, beast to deal with. Um, Anyway, no matter how complicated the, the, the mathematical uh, complexity is, uh, the abundance of halos, uh, the, which the, the, the mass function of the abundance of halos of a given mass is proportional to the number of trajectories uh, that are crossing the threshold in a given interval of scales, um, which is called the first crossing probability, crossing for, for, for the first time in a given interval of scales. Here, notice I'm using S, S is defined here as is the variance of the linear perturbations. Variance of the linear perturbations is a function of the smoothing scale, which is a function of R, so they are all interchangeable quantities. Uh, it's conventional to use S, but it's, it's all the same. Okay, so I don't have time to go through the, the history of the attempts to solve this, this problem. I just want to point out to you that uh, uh, the effect of these uh, correlations between different scales, it, it, it's actually very simple. They suppress the zigzags of your random trajectory. So these random walks are not jagged. They are actually quite smooth. So they do not want to take sharp turns. And therefore, uh, it is meaningful to define the, the derivative of your random walk, which is not something that you cannot do for, for a Markovian random walk. And uh, you can say that the first crossing probability is the probability of your walk to cross upwards because the first crossing has to overtake the barrier, not be, of, be overtaken by the barrier. And uh, otherwise, uh, once this happens, I can forget about uh, uh, second and third crossing because these are, are highly unlikely. So on the first approximation, I can just consider two variables. The, I can just request that uh, for a halo to form, the mean delta, mean enclosed density has to be delta C for spherical collapse. Here I'm just using general formalism. I could say that uh, the threshold is scale dependent, but if, the th if for spherical collapse this is a constant and uh, the derivative of the barrier is zero, so I need to request that the slope of my random walk is positive. So it's actually a simple bivariate uh, uh, a problem with, with only two variables. So there is an analytical solution, an analytical uh, um, approximation for this, which is, uh, works very well. It's actually, you can call it the state of the art for, for this type of problems. And you can see that it works very well. I, I have no time to go through this plot, but you, just, you can just see the agreement of, of the histograms with the theory curves that uh, describe the, the, the first crossing distribution and on a wide range of scales uh, for a wide uh, uh, range of power spectra and, uh, and, and, and barrier types. So you can also see that you can, uh, with minor improvements on the approximation, you can, you can interpolate between two different re regimes. Now this curve is, is projector. This curve is uh, uh, bond et al, so twice the projector. And you can see that uh, uh, you can 
interpolate with the solution between the two regimes. This is a, a solution with, with a power spectrum that has a lot of power on large scales, and this is a, a solution with a, for a power spectrum that has a lot of power on small scales. Uh, cosmology, you, lambda CDM cosmology is more or less a curve that is like this. So it's very close to the sector on large scales. Okay, can we do cosmology with this? Yes and no. So not with just this uh, simple model that I've said, but actually if you now buy this rescaling on the threshold for spherical collapse, then it works very well. Uh, okay, this is a, a bit uh, of an ad hoc uh, prescription. Uh, here you can see the, the, the agreement with the Shetan Torment mass function. Uh, I, I don't want to go into this. There are actually ways to try to predict uh, from first principle this rescaling by adding additional stochastic variables and, and, and which make your model more realistic. But uh, I uh, come and, and, and talk to me later if you're interested. Uh, you can also uh, do uh, naturally non-Gaussianity with this uh, uh, approach because nothing of what I've said so far involves uh, the uh, probability of the process uh, being Gaussian. I've never said the word Gaussian uh, before now. So all that matters for this thing to work is that there are correlations which are mainly given by the choice of a top hat filter in real space, which is uh, 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 enforced by the fact that you're dealing with gravity and, and, uh, and collapse of shells. So what I really want to talk about in the last minutes, which are how many? Seven. Are the clustering properties of, of, of uh, a model uh, like this, of, of uh, structure formations uh, of this type. So uh, let me go back to the figure with the random walk and let's follow this uh, trajectory here that uh, uh, blows up at, uh, at uh, small masses. Remember here you have uh, large uh, smoothing radii, radii uh, large masses and small masses on this side. Uh, this threshold, and uh, remember also the threshold is redshift dependent because I am dividing the threshold of spherical collapse by the growth rate of linear perturbations. So at uh, uh, large redshift, uh, the growth rate is more than one, so the threshold is, is uh, uh, high up there. So the first crossing uh, of the trajectory with the threshold that is uh, up there is here. So this gives uh, some masses. So you project it down onto the, the x-axis, you find the mass that is uh, accreted by the halo at this large redshift. Now, when you go towards the smaller redshifts, what happens? It happens that the threshold uh, drops. It gets lower. So as it gets lower, you see that the first crossing scale moves uh, along this, the, the, the slope of the, of, the, of, the, of the trajectory. And so it, it brings you to larger scales, larger accreted masses. When you reach here, you see that here there, there's, a, there's a jump. It means that if I go to even smaller, uh, sorry, even yeah, smaller redshifts, uh, even l later times, then I have the first crossing scale jumps from here to here. So there is a, there's actually a finite jump that I can interpret as, as a merger. So you can see that following the slope of the trajectory and bridging the gaps in, in this way here is actually a way to, thank you, to describe the uh, um, accretion history of my halos, of my, uh, where, where uh, small inc uh, continuous increments are, are, are um, uh, accretion and uh, finite jumps are, are mergers. So now uh, it's clear now that uh, this part uh, of the uh, trajectory uh, past the, 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 the characteristic scale of the halo describes the formation history, while the, this portion of the trajectory here has to do with the environment because it involves uh, smoothing on scales larger than the Lagrangian radius of the halo. So I am picking up shells that have not collapsed yet. Uh, and now suppose that, okay, so this would be the accretion, accre accretion history of my, of my halo. And suppose now that there is another trajectory that has the same endpoints here and here, 
So it has the same mass at redshift Z2, the same mass at redshift uh, uh, Z1, but otherwise uh, it follows a higher trajectory here. So this different trajectory would describe a halo that is more concentrated, has the same final mass, but is more concentrated because it accretes most of its mass at early uh, times. Okay. So this more concentrated uh, uh, trajectory will reach uh, the, uh, this crossing at the same, at the, the same mass, uh, but will have a, a, sl um, a steeper slope. So it will tend to go to be even lower when you go to uh, larger masses, which means uh, that two halos that have the same mass but two uh, different concentrations, so two different internal structures, will tend to leave uh, to, 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 to form in different environments. So the halo that is uh, more concentrated will tend to form in a, a, a lower density environment. So this is a, it's, this is a, uh, due to the fact that, as I said, that there are correlations between scales. So this is known as assembly bias, and the fact that the random walks are non, non, not Markovian, are non Markovian naturally brings the correlations between the different scales. So the portion of your trajectory uh, that is outside the halo correlates with the portion of the trajectory that is inside the halo. Um, however, so the, these, uh, these effects are there, but there are also, uh, uh, um, thank you, they're also not too complicated for, uh, for a reason that now I'm going, I'm, I'm going to, to tell you in, in, in one minute. So suppose that, okay, I've, I've, tell, I've, I've told you that I have to deal with at least two variables, that is uh, the density enclosed in the shell and uh, the, the increment of these enclosed densities. So how the enclosed density changes when I change the smoothing radius. Okay, so I, I may think, okay, maybe I have to include the uh, second derivative, third derivative, and so on and so forth. And then I will never predict anything. Uh, well, this is not the case because already if I go to uh, the second derivative with respect to the scale, then the, the variance of the second derivative diverges for a, re a reason that is pretty much the same that makes uh, uh, the corrections in Lagrangian perturbation theory uh, to, to, to blow up. So there is intrinsically some stochastic effect that is, in, in this language, is white noise. And it simply means that uh, there is no correlation beyond the, 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 the effect of the slope of the random walk. So all the correlation goes through the slope of the random walk at the Lagrangian scale of the, of the halo. So at the fixed concentration, which is, as I said, related to the slope of the random walk, then the formation history uh, does not depend on the environment, but it does if you marginalize over concentrations. So this is relevant for a lot of problems, including, for instance, the, the formation of reionization bubbles when you explicitly deal with uh, scale that are outside the, your, your, your halo. Uh, okay, so I'm nearly done. I will just quickly say that there is also a nice property that is deviation from universality. So this is something that people that fit simulations worry about. Uh, they say that their fits are almost universal, but not exactly. This is precisely what these type of models predict. You do have small deviations from universality because you have some param cross correlation parameter that describe the correlation between slope and the height of the random walk, but these are uh, uh, predicted to be nearly constant. So the, the uh, deviation from universality, the effect of changing the power spectrum is, uh, is quite small. And uh, you can do bias just in, in a very straightforward way. There is a well-defined procedure. You just turn the crank and, and do it. Uh, I don't have time to, to, to discuss it, but come and ask if you're interested. And so these are my conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention.